Are you tired of using subpar fertilizer that don't give your crops the boost they need? Look no further than Irish Shite, the all-natural and sustainable solution for your farm. Made from the finest blend of Irish animal waste, Irish Shite provides essential nutrients for your crops to thrive. And it's not just good for your crops, it's also good for your skin. With Irish Shite, you'll look 10 years younger. So why settle for less? Choose Irish Shite. It's made right here in Ireland. And be sure to tell your friends and fellow farmers about the power of Irish manure. This message has been brought to you by the Irish Shite Association, the natural choice for a sustainable farm. Well, Kevin, how are you getting on? I'm getting on grand. So nice, we can put our feet up because we've already done the work, haven't we? We have. We already recorded an episode that you're about to hear, but with a twist. What's the twist? We did it live in Dublin, of all places. That's right, I was actually there. That's right. Yeah, we did a live episode at uh, at DIFF, the Dublin International Film Festival, with two very special and wonderful guests, Kate Dolan and Conor McMahon. It was mighty crack, wasn't it? It was mighty crack. And I suppose this is just a brief introduction to say that the audio quality is a little different to what you might be more accustomed to with the the show but I had a great time doing this episode and I think we surprised ourselves I'm delighted that we can actually share it with people yeah I hope you enjoy it first ever live show which means it's also our best ever live show enjoy (laughs) I'll use small words so that you'll be sure to understand, you warthog-faced buffoon. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. <gasps> what did you say? You are a sad, strange little man. Don't call me stupid. <laughs> Hello. And welcome to The Best Bits, a movie podcast where we pick our favorite scenes from randomly selected, weirdly specific themes. I am your co-host, Will, writer of three films plus a Christmas special. And I am joined, as always, by my co-host, writer of one and a bit films and three and a bit episodes of TV, Kevin. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Will. How are you? And we are live at the Dublin International Film Festival. Oh, my God believe it it's oh, mental incredibly here in the lighthouse cinema in dublin it's absolutely amazing it really is yeah. and, uh, but we're down a man and i have a message from the the person that some oh. people might be expecting to be here oh, dear so God. i thought i would just pass it along because um she'd kill me if i didn't hello everyone listen due to being an artificial life form i couldn't get vaccinated so i was unable to provide proof of vaccination in order to be here with you tonight <laughs> I'm fucking raging, but I am hoping you have a good show regardless. And look, I will be connecting remotely with the projection booth to help keep the show on the road. Now back to the bollockses. Love, Podbush. There you go. Oh, God. It wouldn't be the same without her, so I thought that we had to get a little message in there from Podbot. First thing, yes. I'm glad she's not here. Thank God. Oh, my God. I'm glad. But we're not totally alone because we have some guests. No, we have two of Ireland's shining filmmaking stars. Uh, right here we have Kate Dolan, who uh, has just won the Disco- Aer Lingus Discovery Award at, the, at DIFF, who has just had the release of her debut feature, uh, You Are Not My Mother. Uh, give it up for Kate. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Exciting. I was uh, on one episode before, which was your jump scare episode, and I had a great time, so I'm excited to be here today. Yeah. You absolutely petrified me on that episode, Kate. Your story about <laughs> a stranger in your garage looking in the door. So, um, oh Perfect. God, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that stuck with me for quite a while. Yeah. But it's not just Kate tonight. We've, we're doubling up on guests. We also have another Irish filmmaking talent whose film is also playing as uh, Diff. Uh, let the wrong one in, and it is Connor McMahon. Connor, give it up for Connor. <laughs> Woo. Yeah. Thank you. I haven't been invited on the podcast yet, so it's nice to <laughs> finally get the this invite. Is it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> you, you, were busy. You, were, you were finishing up your film. Okay, okay. I'll tell you what, though. When the, the show was announced, I got a text message from my cousin that said, are you interviewing Conor McGregor on the podcast? And I said, no, where'd you hear that from? Oh, it's your mum said that to me. It's like, no, got slightly wrong there. But yeah, Conor, yeah. thanks yeah, for doing it. If I can live up to Conor McGregor. 
<laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> well, it's yeah. great to have you both, right? <laughs> now, to, to, set the, to, to set the machine rolling, we also have to have a topic. And the, the topic we chose, we didn't spin the wheel for this because we knew this was a special occasion. Yeah. Um, since we, for the last two years, because of the pandemic, we have been deprived of our you know, weekly or however often you go to cinema trips, to the cinema or cinema trips. And uh, I said, I thought we thought that since we were doing this in a cinema, why not uh, do an episode which we celebrate our favorite scenes set in the cinema? Yeah, I think it's quite meta. We love that. Whenever we can sort of like fold within the topic itself into the into the type of uh, show that we're going to do. So audience participation is going to be part of this as well. Yeah, okay. we have a, we have guests, we have a topic, we have an audience. Yes. So why not utilize every element we have? We're going to utilize our audience right here, Kevin. Isn't that it? We are. So you saw there that there are loads of choices. And uh, we have four professionals who pitch for a living. Good so you're going to get to see a masterclass from each of us <laughs> on how oh, no. successfully <laughs> no. pitch our choice that is uh, best representative of this um, topic. And then at the end, you're going to get to choose which one you think was the best representation. And that person is going to screen for you a scene that they saw in the cinema that meant an awful lot to them. So uh, that's the uh, little <laughs> nice little thing that we can do with this episode, I think. So you have to focus. You actually have to listen and have to yeah. watch the scenes, please. God and and, and, and most word. importantly, just choose my one because <laughs> it'll be worth it at the end of the day. And don't, whatever you do, do not support Kevin and his antics. That's the main thing. Oh, um, you just know what my uh, pick is if I get the audience uh, <laughs> on my side. <laughs> the, uh, you know, it's going to be <laughs> awful. Um, now, uh, this is to uh, Connor and Kate. We're, we're in a cinema, right? We're people who you know, love going to cinema to watch films. But being filmmakers, it must be incredible going into a, you know, into a cinema to watch your own film you know, screened in front of a live audience. So I'll go to you first, Kate. What was it like for you to sit in a, a cinema, a hometown cinema, and watch your own film on the big screen? Shite. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's a bit of a weird thing because like I love the cinema obviously and like I have been a cinema lover ever since I first set foot in a cinema but I think as a filmmaker I find it really nerve-wracking actually because I think it's like why this is so natural like, <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> I think it's because you know you just put so much work into this film and you've watched it 10 million times you don't even you can't see the wood from the trees you don't know if it's good or bad anymore you don't know if things will make people laugh or be scared or anything so then you're sitting there and you're kind of like like you were saying earlier about the looking at your friend when they're watching the film it's like that but times like 10 million I would say because you're just like loads of strangers and you're kind of like are they gonna like it the whole time which can be quite nerve-wracking yeah, it's, it's not fun at all, is no. it? It's not exactly. <laughs> I agree with you totally. I also think that the temperature can change between screenings because the film will stay the exact same. But when you're with a different type of audience, the film can play entirely differently. Yeah, Just that's, depending yeah. on if a couple come in and they've had a spat, then the, all that row is picking up that weird energy mm. and then nobody wants to sort of like cut loose. And suddenly it's like, the film is shite. And then a totally different crowd, it's like, oh my God, it's amazing. We did a classic. Yeah, yes. I've had that experience as well, and uh, the first screening was Sorry very painful. About that. I have, thanks for walking out <laughs> that first screening. Connor, what about you? What was it like for you, seeing your... Yeah, it was interesting for me because, like, uh, my film, it's a very Dublin film. Like, the, the accents are very Dublin. So we had played in uh, Germany and France before this, so I'd seen um, reactions there. And um, in Sitges, it was interesting because th- it's a horror audience, and they tend to be kind of quite amped up. Like they were cheering when the Orchi logo came up at the start, and it was uh. like, you know, you're, you know, you know, they're kind of uh, a wild audience when that happens. And um, but then I don't know how much they understood of the dialogue. So here was it was like, okay, this is going to be the first time people are going to know the jokes and get yeah. the dialogue um, and that kind of thing. And it was interesting. My mom came to the screening as well, and it was one of those things. Like the last time she came to one of my films was in two thousand and two. And so it was like 20 years since she came to one of my next films. So that was an added sort of weirdness in the mix. <laughs> Did she um, think that you'd improved? <laughs> <laughs> well, she'd always say something like, you know, 
uh, like when I made Stitches, you know, with the killer clown, she said, I thought you were going to make a nice film about the life of a clown. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, don't you know me? And then she'll still like come to my film and then go, I hear they're uh, advertising for jobs for the civil service, you know? Oh, and it's oh like, <laughs> I still get that. I still get, you know, your, your cousins are working in the post office. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, they have a great job. So, yeah, no, so the, so the, so the film was great. And then, and then afterwards they, they asked me in the Q&A what, what, what horror films was I watching lately? And I just got a complete blank. All I could think of was Pam and Tommy. It's like, that's all I'm watching, <laughs> Pam and Tommy. It's like... Pam and, oh, the Pam Anderson thing. Oh, yeah, of course. I saw the original. I thought it was great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I can speak. I, I think I suppose there's enough uh, distance between my first film and now, but I'll always remember the first screening of my first film, and uh, it was in New York and Tribeca, and we were all got dressed up in tuxes, and I did the the, the tuxes, uh, whatever Jeez. they were. I didn't. I wore one, not multiple Notions. tuxes. Um, <laughs> and I did before we went down to the screening. I googled the film to see if there was any reviews and the first review that came out was an absolute scathing review oh god and I just feel my heart, my parents had gone over and all these families had gone over and all this sort of stuff and there was going to be a lot of family at this and I just watched that the first screening of the film which wasn't finished the grading wasn't finished so it was, some scenes were completely dark you couldn't see it and I just felt myself just <laughs> sinking down into my seat and I just went I just want to run can I get a plane out of New York now what can I do I just need to leave the situation so it was it took me quite it took, actually the next screening they got the levels right and the audience loved it and it was a totally different experience. Yeah, it, it really depends. I think the Irish audience, Stephanie, if you're an Irish film, are always going to support you massively. Yeah. Do you know, so you feel a little bit less like it's going to be, a, you know, it's going to be okay. They're going to, even if they don't really like it, they'll still cheer for you. At the yeah. end. <laughs> I think in the first, in that first screening, I actually, my, whoever was with me introduced me to the random New York guy sitting, sitting two, seat, two seats away from me. And he said, oh, he said, this is the guy who wrote the movie. And he went, oh, wow, congratulations. And then throughout the film, he continued to criticize the film openly. Like, and I was going, oh, Jesus. During Christ. the film. During the film. I, he was like going, throwing his hands in the air, like going for a fuck's sake. What's it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Terrible. Yeah, well, happened. that's New York for you, baby. <laughs> I remember when Grabbers was coming out and the trailer had been released and I used to get all my family members sending me like, it's on the entertainment.ie website or whatever. And all the comments were just scathing. And I thought, don't send me this because I know that you've gone right down. It was so embarrassing. What a go. wonderful note to start this episode. And I know, films are fun. <laughs> I love it. But filmmaking <laughs> mightn't be I always have an act fun, going. but films are fun. But let's get back on track, Kevin, right? Yes. Because what we're doing here tonight is we're, we, each one of us, as you've already explained, is going to present our clip. Yes. And you are first... Oh. I am first and I'm going to come first as well because my pick I think represents the dreamers and the schemers, the filmmakers that sort of set off on this treacherous path to make films and this film came out in 1999 and I was just going to college uh, after finishing my leaving cert and I was quite disillusioned with everything and I thought I want to be a filmmaker, I don't know how to do that, the only place I could go to do that was in St. John's in Cork and um, once I had admitted to everybody that I wanted to expose myself and say, I have notions, I want to be a filmmaker, I want You're to do film. You're going to expose yourself. <laughs> yeah, I did many times. <laughs> but um, Still does. Yep. While we're recording. Yep. Uh, not tonight, though. <laughs> but uh, once I committed to it, then I felt a bit sort of um, insecure. And uh, there was a lot of people starting to drop out of the, the course at the start. And uh, I went to see this with two guys who dropped out that week. And it sort of reconfirmed my love for the movies. And it's, uh, it's Bowfinger. And it's the scene at the very end, the premiere, where Steve Martin, and, you know, for me, representation matters. So to see a hero on screen with grey hair really spoke to me. <laughs> but um, through all of the different finagling and sort of uh, stealing scenes and doing all the things that you have to do to sort of guerrilla filmmaking to make a film, it comes good in the end. And uh, it ends on a very sweet note, and it really spoke to me. So I want to show that scene. And uh, roll it there, Podbot. <laughs> CIA operative. Todd Delmonico drove his 53 Buick to meet Keith Kincaid. Kincaid! It had rained that day, but was it normal rain or was it 
chubby ray. I think that's absolutely lovely. <laughs> uh, I didn't realise it was a part of the <coughs> MCU because Iron Man's in it. <laughs> <laughs> but Grabber's Chubby Rain, it's all connected. It's what I love about that is they could have gone really um, quite um, farcical and they could have taken the piss out of it. And they do have a tag at the end where you get to see the sequel where he's shooting a, a kung fu movie with Kit Ramsey. Um, or Kit Ramsey's look like brother. But they just focus on the sincerity of it. Yeah. Okay pulled it off and I love it it just it spoke to me and I, it, it made me conf confirm the path I was on it's and got uh, that Muppets vibe of the, the show know, they, yeah. they made the show happen and it's uh, yeah it's quite charming it is charming it's a great great fun comedy yeah. but the fact that it just doubles down Frank Oz he's a great director yeah. written by Steve Martin and um, it's so sweet and sincere and they commit to it even though that could be considered to be sentimental or maudlin or whatever but it, I think it's just it's a lovely way to, uh, to end that film and I I think it's the best pick tonight. <laughs> oh, well, well, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. My question, I want to throw questions out to our guests now. And my question to, I'll start with Connor this time is, you know, I'm just thinking about that clip and uh, Kevin's experience. W do you think you would have become a filmmaker if you didn't have the cinema experience growing up? I don't think so. Like, I, like the film, and I clearly remember, I, there's a film I went to see in the cinema and I came out a different person. Um, which was the, the Batman 1989 Batman. Oh, yes. Wow. Um, and like that film, like even though it didn't immediately, I didn't start making films, the, the seeds were being sown, you know. I, I, when I came out of that film, well, actually, I started working on my costume and Excellent. I did used to go Vicky up Vale. I used to, <laughs> <laughs> I used to, I mean, it, I, I, the only night of the year I could, like, it was okay, was Halloween. But during yeah. the year, I'd sometimes dress up as Batman and just stand on my garage roof and silently, <laughs> scare people, silently watch over the lanes, you know. Um, and then even, but, but even like when I'd be in school as well, I'd like, I'd have this sort of sense of justice that needed to be done. So, which I was basically just a rat, you know. It's a miracle you're still with us. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so you wanted to be a crime fighter? I, I really thought I was going to be Batman. Excellent. Like, I really thought that. And, like, I couldn't figure out <laughs> why people wouldn't, be, wouldn't do that. It seemed very logical, you know. Yeah. And so I used to make little gadgets and I'll put little bat logos on them and, and things. You know, those little dart guns that you just put in and, oh, yeah. you know, just suckers, you know, but uh -huh. with some string on it and I'd have them at the ready. But anyway... So my early, so, but the minute I got a camera, like I was like, I, I'm going to make Batman type films, you know, and, yeah, yeah. And, and superhero stuff. So it, but like, it definitely, yeah, that film, that film really inspired me. So because the reason I think it's a good question uh, is that we see more movies on the small screen than we do on the big screen. But those moments that sort of really hit with you, is it the shared experience? Is it that, that idea of like watching it with a crowd and feeling like I just got emotional there watching Bowfinger just because I'm sharing it with all you guys at the moment. It's a weird sort of like alchemy that goes on. I know, yeah. I just laced your drink with some sedatives. <laughs> um, it didn't need any lacing. Okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> right. But Kate, what about you? Yeah, I think, you know, I grew up where a lot of big films that I saw growing up, um, my mom used to like be a real film lover, but she, we used to just rent VHS tapes all the time or like DVDs then when that happened. So... Like a lot of big films that I saw when I was young first was actually just on the TV or I used to, you know, if they came on TV, I'd make a point of watching them. But like, for example, I remember watching 
Apocalypse Now on TV because I had heard I was kind of like getting into film nerd space and I was like I've heard this is amazing <laughs> I'll watch it on TV How old are you? Six? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I was about like 14 Okay And I was like okay I'll watch it on TV and I watched it and I was like I was amazed by it as a film watching it on my telly in my house but then I remember actually it was the diff we're doing uh, like a screening of like Apocalypse Now as I think it might have been an anniversary or something like that, um, like the following year. And I was like, I begged my mom <laughs> to take me to it. And she was like, oh God, okay, fine. Because she was like, I'm not really into watching Apocalypse Now in the cinema, but I'll go with you. <laughs> yeah. I was like, perfect. And um, I was just like, it just was transformative to see a film that I had loved so much on the small screen on a big screen because it was just like so much more immersive like just the sound everything all the audience everything like that and it just yeah I think it there's no experience that matches it really I don't think. you were just saying earlier on that before we started recording that the Godfather is out at the moment and they're they're screening it again for the 50th anniversary and I have found I don't know what it's like for you guys that sometimes when you watch films that you've grown up with on the big screen, you see them projected for the first time. Some of them go up several levels in sort of the quality and what you think of them. And some of them sort of fall down because of the intensity of just watching it in one straight go. You, you're really exposed to the editing. The other, the other thing as well is sometimes, like I remember I saw E.T., like I, 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 I was, I got a day off school for, for I don't know how I convinced my mom. They was playing was, Batman, <laughs> scaring the other kids. <laughs> but, but it was like sometimes as well, you don't realize how funny films are. Yeah, like, yeah. like I never realized E. T. was so funny. Or, um, <laughs> but like it's, it's like it almost played like a comedy with the audience. You know, there's a lot of gags in that movie. And uh, that's how The Exorcist played when I saw that <laughs> with a, an audience. They were in stitches. But it's like, yeah, it is that thing where I, I noticed with films I, would, I knew very well, I saw extra little moments and jokes in it that I, that I ne- had never noticed on TV. Yeah. Mm. It is incredible. I, I don't know if I've said it on the podcast before, but um, yes. I've had, tra- yeah, more than likely I have, <laughs> and I don't remember. Um, I've had, I had several traumatic experiences in the cinema when I was young. The first film I went to that I was allowed to go to see on my own uh, well, more more like my the, the first one. My father decided that he couldn't be asked going taking me to some sea was Pinocchio, and it was about five or something like that. And I don't a, understand the story. Your dad dropped you off the cinema at five and said, "Make your own way back." <laughs> no, he said, "I'll what pick you up." No, on? he walked me up to the ticket booth. He okay. asked, he asked Poo Poo Reardon, who's the guy who owned the cinema. He said, oh, yeah. oh, "I shouldn't have said the name." Actually, just five minutes. <laughs> He said, what time is the film over at? And he said, oh, about an hour or something like that. He says, oh, and I'll be back from you. Yeah, just don't Get let him four or five points in and I'll be back. And <laughs> my father didn't drink, but he w- did like other sort of narcotic drugs. And um, so when I went in, the film was already going. It was packed house. I went to the back seat, sat beside this other lad. And the other lad pretty much quick, very quickly says, what age are you? And I said, uh, I'm eight. And he says, do you have any money? And my father had given me <laughs> like 50 pence piece. And uh, I said, no. So I just clutched my hand. I had, still have the imprint of the 50 pence piece on my palm today. So, um, and that's why you became a screenwriter. That is why I became to, to <laughs> oh, try and exi- exercise that demon. But I would say that I think I would have become a filmmaker, a screenwriter, without the big screen, big, big cinema experience, because it was, I experienced most of my films RTE on, guide. on the R3 R2 guide, <laughs> circling, the, circling the movies and watching them at home and uh, taping them when I could, when we eventually got a tape recorder. Um, but when you do see a film on the big screen, as you were saying, it just gets magnified. Yeah. And you get to really appreciate the filmmaking and the little details you see. And just, I don't know, it's, I can't imagine what it, you know, what it would have been like to see Apocalypse Now the first time it came out or Godfather when it was on the big screen uh, with an audience. Uh, You'll also notice as well like, that your film will feel different, your own films, like when you watch them on the small screen like down the line. It'll feel like a different experience. They, sort of, they have these different lives, the films themselves. They t- just sort of take on their own life. Yeah. <laughs> now we'll edit that out, Kevin. <laughs> we have uh, we've got your pick out of the way, which yes. you know, I, you know, I so know who's, who's going to top me. Who could possibly top you? We're going not in line. that way, but who's going to best me, Connor? We're going to move over to Connor now. Connor, do you want to set up your clip first of all? Yes. So I suppose this is a film that I've watched many, many times over the years. It's it's one of those films that is in my DNA somewhere. You know, that, that often you know those films where you just kind of quote them 
And even if you don't, even if no one else gets the quote around you, there's, um, it's also probably the first comedy horror I ever saw. And I, th the first time I saw it, I have to say, I didn't totally get it. And it, I wasn't the biggest fan of it. How but old it, were you when you saw it? I, I saw it definitely in my early teens, like maybe 13 or something like that. Okay. And I didn't really know what, because I'd never seen a film like it. So I didn't really know what I was watching. But I was, I was sort of intrigued by it. And I, I went back to it again and again and again. Um, so the film is An American Werewolf in London. <laughs> Very good. Good. <laughs> and, um, was I supposed to say that? You should not say it. Because <laughs> oh, I'm already picturing the scene, so I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> um, and so, um, I mean, I, I can talk a bit about it afterwards. Or yeah. we can roll it there, pop yeah. Good movie. Mm hmm. What can I say, Jack? You don't have to say anything, David. What you going to say, I told you so? If I was still alive, I probably would. But I did tell you so, you schmuck. You look awful. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean it. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't even know if it was me that killed those people last night. I don't remember doing it. What about the zoo? Well... Even if I'm not the wolf man, I'm crazy enough to do something like that. I mean, look at me. Here I sit in a porno theater in Piccadilly Circus talking to a corpse. I'm actually glad to see you, Jack. I want you to meet some people. David Kessler, this is Gerald Bringsley. Gerald's the man you murdered on the subway. We thought it best for you not to see him, as he's a fresh kill and still pretty messy. Yes. I do look most unpleasant. Why are you doing this to me? This isn't Mr. Goodman's idea. He's your good friend. Whereas I am a victim of your carnivorous lunar activities. Mr. Brinsley, I'm sorry. I have absolutely no idea what to say to you. You've left my wife a widow and my children fatherless. And I understand I am to walk the earth in limbo, one of the living dead, until the wolf's bloodline is severed and the curse lifted. You must die, David Kessler. David, this is Harry Berman and his fiancée, Judith Browns. Hello. Hello. And these gentlemen are Alf, Ted, and Joseph. Can't say we're pleased to meet you, Mr. Kessler. What shall I do? Suicide. You must take your own life. That's easy for you to say you're, you're already dead. No, David. Harry and I and everyone you murder are not dead. The undead. Why are you doing this to me? Because this must be stopped. How shall I do it? Sleeping pills? Not sure enough. I could hang myself. No. No, if you did it wrong, it could be painful. You'd choke to death. So what? Let him choke. Do you mind? The man's a friend of mine. Well, he ain't no friend to me. Gentlemen. Please. The gun! I know where you can get a gun. Don't I need a silver bullet or something? Oh, be serious, would you? Madness. Oh, a gun would be good. Yes, you just put the gun to your forehead and pull the trigger. But if you put it in your mouth, you'd be sure not to miss. Thank you. You're all so thoughtful. A knife. An electric shock. A car crash. You could throw yourself in front of a tube. Drowning. Please. <laughs> Run! Okay, thank you. Bye. Wow, so that sums up the cinema experience for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, originally he'd written that as cartoons on the screen, but then he realised they didn't play cartoons anymore in, in, the, in the cinema, so he updated it. My so God. Now. Yeah. Yep. The times changed since he wrote, because I think he wrote the original draft 10 years before. I saw that film when I was five and a half. 
Really? I swear oh, to God. This is one of those films you saw when you were five and a half? Yeah. Oh my God. So Halloween, Halloween 2, American Werewolf in London and the Terminator. Explain so much <laughs> about you, Kevin. It does. Yeah. There we go. But that, yeah, th- or, like that film did have a, a big effect on, because like, I, I remember I made one of my earliest films. It was, well, it was a film that was originally called Night of the Wolfman. And uh, we'd set some lights up our back lane to, to film it. And these local lads started throwing stones at us. And, and I was like, oh, how are we going to fix this? And so I rewrote it then as Day of the Wolfman. <laughs> and we, we, that was my way around it. Because I was like, sometimes you can see the moon during the day, you know. And if I just get a shot of that moon during the daytime, I can... Uh, but, um, but yeah, that, that was the, I think that and Evil Dead 2 were the biggest early influences of that I, co- comedy horror combination. And, yeah, uh, and you've held true to that because, like, you're doing horror comedies now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think, and, and I always go back to that movie. Um, it is the best of that genre. Like, when you think of horror comedies, there's nothing yeah. that really gets the tone right. Where it's genuinely scary and also ridiculously silly. Yeah, yeah and I kind of feel, like, I almost feel if they remake that, they probably won't do, th- like, you probably won't see Absolutely a scene like that not. in it. No. It's like, it's like they won't go there anymore in that kind of, that's just that weird combination. Um, but the last time I saw that film was actually in Fright Fest in London. This is about six years ago. And John Landis was at it. And he sat in front of me and he was talking about the film through the whole film. So it was like... To this himself? Li- <laughs> <laughs> to to some beside him. But it was like this live audio commentary of John Landis. And I was yeah. just so tempted to tell him to shut up and stop talking <laughs> during his own film. But, oh, man. Oh my yep. God. What, what I think is class about that scene is, is the dial, that dial of the tone from... Like humor, like humor, and it gets more ridiculous and absurd yeah, yeah. and absurd, and then it goes right in, into serious horror and terror. Like, I was, I was ready to run out the door there, <laughs> when, you know, towards the end. It is a, an excellent scene. Um, but it, it, the question I wanted to throw to everyone here is uh, kind of a broad question, and I think everyone in the audience would have their own specific answer to this. Um, do you have any particular cinema rituals? And describe your perfect cinema experience. Now, I think, I think we gonna... know what Connors is. It's a oh, porno right. theater. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, since I went to God, Kevin, could you answer that one first of all? Do you have any particular rituals? Like, is there any particular seat you want to, that you love to sit in, or um... uh, somewhere in the middle? Right. Shocking. No, I love going to the cinema uh, on a Monday or a Tuesday uh, when it's raining outside, and uh, I'm getting to see something that came out on Friday, and it's gotten good notices or whatever, the obnoxious teenagers are not there anymore mm-hmm. and uh, I can focus on the film and you just have uh, a really chilled sort of matinee experience with a film and I just love that and that was how I saw so many films during college was like, you know, you'd have a free class and you'd sneak off to the Capitol Cinema be pouring them with rain, grey, grim days and you sit in there and watch like The Sixth Sense or what have you and it was just, I love those cinema trips. That'd yeah. be m- one of mine. Absolutely, Kate. How about you? Do you have any not very exciting rituals? <laughs> well, I you sacrifice so, anything before you go in, or um, not quite. But uh, I did. So I, <laughs> my first r- time I went to cinema, and I do think it's the first time. Nobody can confirm, but it's the first time I remember. My granny took me, and she brought me to McDonald's drive-through before and then brought me into cinema and I hadn't finished all my chicken nuggets and she was like <laughs> she was like oh just bring them in because she was a real granny who was just like yeah just eat the thing and we'll pay for it at the counter like she was just like no but I, if anyone says anything I'll tell them to shut up and we were like okay and I like brought in my chicken nuggets and I remember being so delighted with myself that I was like able to eat McDonald's chicken nuggets in the cinema and then I think it imprinted on my brain because there was a, for a long time when I had like I had one of those cinema cards for Cineworld in Dublin when I was in college, and like I kind of started to up myself in terms of like what food I could bring in. To having the cinema. a Chinese, <laughs> yeah, like literally <laughs> once I went to um, De Fontaine's Pizza on like, like near Parliament Street, and I got them to put a full. 22 inch pizza into four smaller boxes wow. and me and some friends brought them in and we ate pizza while we were watching like I can't remember what we this were is why I go to the cinema on like a Tuesday to avoid <laughs> <people> like this <laughs> this probably was on a Tuesday to be fair but I think like I just I love like eating things in the cinema it makes it more like I don't know like you feel at home there or something like it that it explains why your pockets are bulging with chicken nuggets right <laughs> yeah, now. I know it's, like, it's been making me salivate the entire time <laughs> that's incredible Connor how about you do you have any rituals or um yeah, the food thing definitely. For me, though, it's always like a packet of Frosties, 
Uh, Wait, what? Butter Frosties? Frosties? Oh, do they like Did the cornflakes? Like little cola anyone? sweets. Oh, yeah. Oh, cola sweets. That's like being in <laughs> cereal with Jenny. <laughs> Frosty. Oh, God. Uh, uh, Pepsi. But like you get, there was like a, a, a euro or something for the bigger bottle of Pepsi. Roll yeah. of cola. Um, and cheese, cheese popcorn. But yeah. I, used to, I used to hide it because I, I used to think they'd take it off you and I'd be <laughs> stuffing it into like, you know, my pockets, my coat. And, <laughs> yeah. But then I got more like confident, like, and then I just sort of, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna have it in the bag and I'm gonna walk right in. And, um, and then my other thing is, see, I, I used to, I, I wanna sit in the middle, but I kind of gauged that when you say the middle, they sometimes favor towards the back of the middle. So yeah. now I say five rows. I say, I, I'm very specific. I usually say five rows from front, except in here. But if I know the cinema, it's like five rows from the, from the front. I uh, have my popcorn. The other thing I, I used to do, this sounds just like me being a jerk, but like they used to check your Cine, Cine World ticket at the counter, but then they also used to make you take it out at the, on the way up the escalator. And okay, I used yeah, yeah. to just see how long I could pretend to look for it. I, I mean, I had one, but I hated taking it out. To before they just usher me on. <laughs> so I just used to, and I'd wait for the cues to build up behind me. So this I, was a tactic, I just, so that you I didn't just, have to produce your ticket a second time. I just didn't see the point of why I had Excellent. to do it twice. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It was a kind of a, an act of defiance, a kind of a yeah, yeah. political act. Almost. And I had my bag of sweets, like, yes. on display. Hell <laughs> like, yes. yeah. Would you sort of, like, mark out, like, what was playing in screen one and what was playing in screen two, so you could duck out of screen one afterwards and go into screen two? I never really did that all that much. Oh, I did it. It's great. I did it once or yeah. twice. One thing I think, one thing I started doing when, when you know a cinema really well is like purposely choosing what film you go see based on what screen it's in. Because you're like, Absolutely, oh, that's the yeah. dud screen. No way. I'm not seeing it in there. And like you kind of start to know where it's going to be most enjoyable for you. Yeah. Mm. There's a repertory cinema in London called um, the Prince Charles. Oh, lovely. And yeah. Do you think so? I think it looks like a porno theater. It looks it like does, that. It does look I like look, that. Yeah. It's like I don't like it at all. I don't the like seats it. are really uncomfortable. So anytime like friends of mine say, we'll go to the Prince Charles, whatever's playing. I'm like, yeah, is it playing screen two or screen one? Because screen two is like a normal cinema. And I like that. The, the Prince Charles is just, it's rickety chairs. And the new Beverly in LA is the same way. It's like, I'm not, I don't want to watch a film with 70s aesthetics and 70s sort of sound and... It's also so. the older, as much as I love the older cinemas, that low, like we're in the lovely, wonderful lighthouse cinema, we've got a great kind of like inclination, like a 45 degree angle. Yeah. Almost. But in those old cinemas, it's flat. It's like, well, maybe about four degrees. It's and like you're, you're looking at a 15 inch telly, like down a hallway, and it's like, this is great, amazing movies and magic. And if someone has got, a, is quite la- like, has a big hairdo in front of you, you're not going to see the middle of that frame. No way. Nope. Um, one of my rich, my, oh, I won't say my obnoxious ritual. No, I Say won't. It. One, Say of my, it. one of my tactics, because I, you know, when you're in a, an empty, you pick, I'm like Kevin, I will go midweek. I used to, when I was in college, I, was, I, I discovered I had like the afternoon off. So I was going seeing films at two o'clock in the day and then going out, getting the food with whoever was with me and going back in to see something at six. And you know how annoying it is when you You'd go are, twice in one day? Yeah, baby. Oh, I couldn't do that. What? No. Oh, my God. No. How, well, anyway, we won't get it. We'll get into it off, Mike, and have a fist fight about it. <laughs> That's good for a podcast. Um, <laughs> but I would, I, I hated when people would just sit too close to you. And so irritating. Someone would sit right behind you and you get the old kick in the seat. It's like so being a urinal. It's I like have go a tactic. to the opposite end, please. I have a tactic, right? So when anyone would walk into the cinema, the safety if it was, obviously, they could see me, I would start stretching and make myself really big. Oh, God. <laughs> so that when they were walking in, they'd go, I'm not sitting near that guy. And I would go, hi, <laughs> sit here, <laughs> sit here. <laughs> take off your jump and put that on that. For some reason, they would one. never sit near me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so. just like take your shoes take everything off. off or something. <laughs> Like yeah. putting your feet. <laughs> Wiggle my toes at them. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> but um, I think we need to move on to the, the pick that's going to win tonight. And uh, <laughs> it's my pick. Um, I just preface this, first of all, that this is uh, it's five minutes long and uh, it will be on the test. So um, I'd also like to indication. preface it and say, prepare to have the best five minutes of your lives. <laughs> yeah. Whatever happened before now, it's, your life is going to peak right now. This is a film that I, uh, that I discovered uh, uh, a few months ago. I watched it on YouTube and um, it's stuck with me ever since. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually did watch this for the first time on YouTube within the last year. 
This, I'm going back 100 years almost to 1924, Sherlock Jr. I wanted to pick Cinema Paradiso, but I used this in season one. I vetoed it. I Kevin said, no, vetoed it's already, it. No, it's already been... Well, yeah. first of all, Connor wanted to pick that. True, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So we can't... Well, I couldn't pick and that I one. And I said, no fucking way. So I said, right, I'm <laughs> gonna, I need to mix things up a little bit. And I went, you know what's a lovely scene? It's a scene from uh, Sherlock Jr., Buster Keaton's movie from 1924, it's an absolute cracker of, the, of a film. It's all on YouTube. It's 45 minutes long. Um, it's, uh, if, and it, I'm, maybe some of you haven't seen it before. It's a really simple concept about a film projectionist who dreams of being a detective. And in his day life, his uh, love rival has framed him for the, the theft of his future father-in-law's watch. And uh, he's been ousted. So he's back in his projection boost, projection boost feeling... Uh, uh, rejected and outcast from you know his 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 life, and he falls asleep and he dreams. And what he dreams is that he dreams that he can go. He goes into the cinema and actually steps in through the screen, and a magic ensues. So I think it's appropriate time to play the clip. So Podbot, could you play the clip for us, please? Here we go. Five minutes. It won't be that long. <laughs> <laughs> Well, oh, there you go. That you was know. a good one. It's a, yeah. it's a lovely one. Do you know uh, what, though? There's what? so many films that come after that that used a lot of those same ideas. There you go, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. It's still not as good as Bowfinger, but it's, uh, it's an interesting say that. pick. <laughs> I love that for a, no, a couple of reasons. One, uh, you know, hasn't, ha, hasn't, hasn't, haven't all of us at one stage dreamed of, you know, stepping into a film? I imagine, Connor, you might have dreamed of stepping into the film and the, you know, American Werewolf <laughs> <Carol> London. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, who are you? Um, but um, I also, but I love the combination of the, the vaudeville, uh, acts, which is like, you know, this craft and skill and precision uh, it, that went into making their particular gags work uh, on screen. But I also love the, the fact that they were combining that with the inventiveness of how to master this, this new form of entertainment of film. And I'm still astounded how they pulled off some of those matching gags because we see them going from like a, a snowy, uh, a snow, a snowy, whatever, g- park Lab's to a, you know, a, 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 a it's just full of trick whatever. shots. Trick like shots. He, he, that's just one sequence, and there's so much going on. Like he really committed to uh, delivering broke, to the audience. He, he broke his neck in one scene in this. He actually, broke his neck in, on camera. Ooh. He was pulling anyway. He was hanging from a height and he fell onto a rail tracks, and he knocked himself out. It was an excruciating pain. And it was only a few years later they realized the doctors X-rayed him and says you, you broke your neck. You know, you know, a few years ago. And he went, oh, maybe that's what that bad pain in my neck was during filming Sherlock Junior. Um, I think it's a marvellous film. Do you know how they did? did the, I, like, I'm watching that going, how did they do it? It like, was incredible. They actually used uh, engineering tools. Yeah, no, CGI. <laughs> they used, like, they got all engineering tools and actually measured all of the uh, angles where he, like, where he was. And they put him back into the same spot. They cut, then they trimmed the, fi- the last frame wow. and they took, it to, they took it on to the next location and matched them up matched perfectly to make sure that it's so, so precise. Did he wow. direct that? He, di- so. he directed most of it, but Fatty Arbuckle who was blacklisted at the time, directed a uh, bunch of it because they were... He was blacklisted at the time? He was, well, no, he was blacklisted. Freddie Arbuckle had a... But not at the time when that was made. Yeah, he was blacklisted at the time. What was he blacklisted for? Be- well, there was... He, he was blacklisted because of a rape incident. Oh, well, he was one of the big, he was actually sort of <laughs> He was the biggest star in Hollywood in the late 1910s and himself and, uh, and uh, Buster Keaton trends. were... Um, they were collaborators. Fatty Arbuckle was a multi-millionaire at that stage and he got blacklisted because of the trials that he went, underwent. Uh, Buster Keaton was trying to throw him a bone and got him in to direct this, but apparently Fatty Arbuckle and himself fell out during the making of this and he was fired. See, there's no such thing as getting cancelled. Yeah, well, there you go. Well, he was. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, that was my pick, guys. That was my I pick. I actually liked it. But again, I think the ranking is one, two, three. <laughs> oh, well, there we go. Now, I'm bringing it back to the cinema experience, right? And I'm pu- putting, throwing out my generic questions. And I just want to know, uh, are, with going to the cinema, are you a solo person? Do you like to go alone or do you like to go with a particular person? Or uh, what, way would, what way do you like to play? Um, I, I'd go both ways. Good. Um, Verse. But, but <laughs> I, um, I definitely love going on my own. Like, yeah. there's something I love about... Because um, I know, like, my, my 
other yeah but some people find it weird but but there's certain films like and, and especially i like going to films i really like i'll go more than once like i like i think some of the like jurassic park i know i, I used to go on my own like you know a good few times when it was out or aladdin was another favorite early on but there's something just like i love that feeling where and you go into the cinema and it's like nobody nobody can disturb me now mm-hmm. you know yeah like you go in phones off and nobody knows i'm here and yeah. nobody can interrupt me for the yeah. next two hours and there's something I, I, I there's always just that little comforting feeling comes over me when i sit down in my chair and then i'm just waiting then that nobody sits in front of me or, or comes or in near. too close to yeah. me that and then it's like it snaps me out of that and then i'm like ah. it's irritating yeah. yeah and i think as well the joy of being alone i actually remember the first film I went to on my own in the cinema and I was 17 and it wow. was uh, Let the Right One In, the um, not let the, the Swedish, <laughs> Swedish, yeah. <laughs> not, yeah, funny, it was Let the Right One In um, and I remember just loving the film so much and I think it was really what appealed to me when I was, because I was really nervous about going on my own and then what really appealed to me was that I think I could react however I wanted to the film oh, yeah, and nobody yeah. would know. And I like had, I, I just like, you know, it was like, oh, nobody can see me or nobody here knows me. I can react to however I want to this, which is like really freeing, I think, in a way. So, yeah, I love going to my own. But now I have to go with my girlfriend all the time. So. There you go. Yeah. I uh, <laughs> used to, I, I now primarily go on my own because we've got small kids and stuff like that. And I used to love going with my wife, who's generally a great experience. I, uh, I also loved going with a couple of friends from college that uh, they were great because I love the experience of having a chat afterwards. But there's nothing worse than going to the cinema with someone who's an annoying cinema goer. And yeah. I, it's the only time... Describe I, an annoying cinema goer. Well, I, I, have a, like I, have a, I have a specific... They, uh, I have a specific... I have nuggets in their pocket. <laughs> 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 yeah, they They've got a walk going <laughs> and, uh, and doing a pavlova. And, and anyway, there was... Uh, I went to see... Uh, such the nerd that I am, I was so excited about Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace coming out back in 1999. I got midnight tickets... And I Ugh. went with one of them. Oh, oof, you can, oh, wait. But I went. I was such a nerd. And I no, went I'm saying it's sad that you went to see that. It would have been I, such a letdown. I went with but one, also nerd. one of my friends who was, he, he wasn't a great companion to go to cinema with because he was a bit n- noisy and, rowed, uh, and rowdy. And uh, anyway, there I was. I've been waiting for this for 18 years. And uh, he was sitting about three people over from me. And the cinema was packed with Star Wars fans, all waiting and with anticipation for the Lucasfilm logo to come up and the Fox logo. And then, you know, and then the, uh, a galaxy uh, in a, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away came up. And he decided at that moment to lean across three people and go, hey, hey, hey. And I, <laughs> and I just went, I slapped them right across the face. <laughs> it was the only time I've actually physically assaulted anyone in the cinema. And I just slapped them. And uh, that ended our friendship. It's, Kevin, uh, how about you? It's, uh, well, I was just going to suggest that you mentioned that Star Wars because I remember my experience of that was I went to see it in the Cinemobile in Leitrim. And there was something weird about being watching, a, you know, the cinema. It's like a bus yeah. that converts yeah. into a cinema. But there's something weird about seeing those space scenes and then hearing cows and dogs <laughs> barking <laughs> outside oh, the cinema. <laughs> it just kind of pulls you out of the oh, experience. Brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, I don't like going to the cinema on my own. I just, I, I love being able to like lean over and talk about what the trailers are coming up. Not that. Like, yeah. um, and then Will will slap you. <laughs> yeah. But the trailers are okay. Right? There's, There's a point the, when the, I want people to stop talking to me. Like, you know, when it's like, yeah. the commercials are fine. If they start talking during the trailers, I start but getting a bit nervous. But as soon as the first act yeah. is over, it's like, no more talking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's well, <laughs> I think as well, like one thing I think would be an like immediate cancelled as a friend forever is if I knew anybody who took their phone out during a film be like oh, yeah. that's that's you're blacklisted then yeah, Paddy so Argo but Paddy Argo <laughs> I've, had say, I've, I've said it to a couple of people and I felt really bad how would you say it nicely but yeah it's yeah, it's, it's worse it's like, yeah. you go to the cinema in London and everyone's got their phone out no? they're just God. like playing games they're they're TikToking it's all going on it's <laughs> <TikTok-ing>. mental <laughs> yeah we should uh, go on to Kate's pick right okay would you could you set up your pick for us, please, Kate? Yeah, I'm wondering whether to tell you what it is or not. Okay, so this film I saw first, I was thinking about it uh, in prep for this, and I believe it was kind of a double bill at a sleepover situation. So it wasn't in the cinema when I saw this. And I think the reason it resonated with me first, I think I was like a teenager and it was like all girls sleepover, everyone screaming. 
we had watched the first film, uh, which this is a sequel, and we were riled up to the nines with the first one. And then we were like, put on the next one. And we are like screaming. And uh, we put it on and it opens with this scene. So it's opening scene in the movie. And I think at first I was just so riled up by just in the scene, how excited people are to be at the cinema and all the palaver and the people running around and they're all dressed up. And I was like, I want to be there. That is my ideal cinema going experience. Oh, and that was what? like my first, wow. like, exp- like uh, you know, before what happens in the scene happens. And I was just so enthralled by it. And then obviously it's so dramatic. And then when I, w- I've seen this film now probably over 20 times I'd say at this point and the more I watched it as I got older I realised just like how meta it is about viewing films in the cinema especially as a sequel that's referencing its first film and uh, yeah so enjoy Podbot rolling Kate, your pick was 1997's Scream 2. Yes. Great pick. (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, like, just as soon as you guys were like, your favourite scene set in a cinema, (laughs) that was my immediate, like, that's the one that's, like, burned into my brain of a cinema scene. And, you know, there's cinema parodies, so I know we're all, you know, film lovers, (laughs) but I was like, that's the one that gets me most excited, I think. And I think it's just so interesting, like, what they... You know, Scream is so clever the way they talk about films and how you, you know, perceive films as a film goer and like, you know, how meta it gets. And I love the idea that everyone's kind of watching her get stabbed and then they're all cheering for the girl in the movie getting stabbed. It's just so so fun. And like, yeah, what um, Kevin said, uh, you know, quote from the first movie is like, horror movies don't make psychos, they just make them more creative. And then it's like they double down on that in the sequel very much by like bringing the cinema audience in by having that first scene in a cinema. I just think it's confronting them with actual real violence. It's like this is what you guys are cheering for and enjoying and should you really. And when they really see what it's like, they're repulsed. And I love the way he just holds on it. It's like he's not letting you look away from it. It's like this is real violence and you shouldn't be cheering for this. Yes. But yeah. yeah exactly. Well, it's still being really funny and meta and stuff. But yeah, I I would have gone with this pick as well. But I knew you were going to go with it. So because um, <laughs> I screamed too for me it was up there with Jurassic Park, where the audience was like being played like a symphony, and it was just scream here, laugh there, scream here. And I thought I want to write these kind of things that have this reaction from audiences. So I saw this like opening weekend, like as a teenager. And I loved it. And it's, I think it's a, a brilliant sequel. Yes, it is. I think the, the funny, fun fact, I've never actually seen this film in a cinema. Well, no, you got to. Now I have to. <laughs> oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, the only thing, close to a cinema, it was, uh, only thing close to a cinema I've seen it in was a drive-in uh, in Leopardstown, which isn't the same. No, really. it's not. No, not at all. Also, <laughs> having seen Scream 5 recently, the audiences are not the same anymore. I think we were a little bit more innocent and naive and sort of just totally enthralled by, we didn't know, we, there were no spoilers, we didn't know what was going to happen and you like these characters and the hype for this film was huge at the time. So um, it was a very different reaction seeing Scream 5 recently and then seeing this when I was like a teenager, it was like night and day. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That's a I think great I- pick. Because it was 1997 and I think I was seven then when this came out. And I remember being, we were in Belgium for some reason. And at the cinema in Belgium, it was there, but it didn't have a rating. And I was begging my mom (laughs) to like bring me in and let me see it. She was like, absolutely not. You're going to be so scared of it. And I was like, please. She was like, no. Um, But from seven, I think probably until, I think it was probably like, 10 or 11 then when I actually did see it I was like obsessed with seeing it because it was so in the culture everywhere it was like the media was massive around it Yeah, I was at an internet cafe in in Brighton once and um, these two little girls they must have been 8 or 9 they were using the the computer beside me 
and one of them was showing the other one all the images from the Scream series on Google Images. I thought, is this appropriate to say <laughs> something or not? And he was like clicking through and showing it on this little computer. They were like tiny little girls. And I thought, how do you even know about this film? And why are you looking up all these murder images? But anyway. When I watch this, when I watch this scene, it's an excellent scene, but I, I'm just reminded of uh, how different the cinema going experience in the States is compared to over here. They are very, very <laughs> engaged with the film. Like, you know, they're cheering along with us and they're going, yeah, man. And, you know, they love the one liners and all that sort of stuff. I saw Land of the Dead and um, there's a moment in it, I think it's John Leguizamo, where he gets out all the weapons and one guy st- stood up and I thought, this is taking the piss. This is going on. And he goes, no, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, wow. They actually do that stuff. Yeah. Well, even mental. recently, did you see the Spider-Man No Way Home? They were setting off fireworks in the cinema. <laughs> what? Literally. Oh, my God. So it's still happening. Well, it has to be a Marvel movie now, but, you know. And to what end? I'm like, oh, what's, <laughs> what's the point? Like, what's the, why, why set off fireworks inside an, oh, it's an area that is soonly, you know, quite combustible? Yeah, I think they had to evacuate the cinema, but like, good crack. <laughs> yeah, oh, great crack. <laughs> oh, I'm sure, I'm sure they had a ball. Yeah. Although, do you ever, did you see the, the footage of um, the audience reacting to, was it Spider-Man or was it one of the Avengers? And they were going fucking batshit, where they were like, yeah. I would hate to watch a, a film with that kind of crowd. There's a level to how much you can enjoy a film, I think. Yeah. They can go overboard. We even find it difficult to do polite pauses at the end of uh, uh, a, a, a film. I get really cringed out by that. When yeah. <laughs> Connor, have, <laughs> you ever had an, cinema. have you ever had an awful cinema experience? An awful cinema? I think I had one in here, in this cinema here. Tonight. I'm d- <laughs> 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 well, it was like, you know the way you get messers in a, in a, in a film? Boy, but yes. now, but if the film is 2001, yeah. there's a lot of silence in that movie. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's just like, you know, sometimes like the, me- the chatting and the mess and you, you can't hear it so much, you know. Yeah. But uh, like I remember, like it's one of those films where I've, I've been waiting to see it on a big screen for a long time. And it's like, I'm going to immerse myself in this. And again, it's just like, like... Uh, during that silence and people laughing and, and like, oh, that was, that was an awful cinema experience. If the audience turns on the film and you're into the film. Yeah. When The Exorcist got re-released in 99, I think oh, it was. Yeah, everyone was laughing. I, yeah. everyone, I was watching yeah. going, this is class and just entire crowd. You know, a college My crowd was raging about that. Yeah, raging. They the turned disrespect. It, it was awful. <laughs> well, I think because I'm just looking at the clock, I think it is time for the audience to pick Kevin. Yes. Um, but do I have to do it? I'm losing the nerve to do it. Do it. Oh, right, go oh, on. I, I was going to... I, so like, how we're going to gauge this is... I, it's going to be by... Uh, we're going to use an applause meter um, yes. And wait. I downloaded this. and I'm going to try it. <laughs> will, it will you go with number one, which is my pick? A love letter to movies, to dreamers and schemers and filmmakers everywhere. Or will you go with Connor's pick, number two, boobs? <laughs> or will you go with... Will's pick number three, homework. (laughs) Or Kate's pick number four, murder. The decision (laughs) is yours. It would be better if I could edit it. You're so (laughs) cheesy, Kevin. You're so (laughs) cheesy. Stop it. (laughs) Stop it. The the podcast is... is Seriously, the podcast is a year... Actually, our first episode aired a year ago. One year, two days ago. ago, So our uh, first anniversary. And we're slick as shit. Yeah, we're slick as shit. (laughs) We're thick as shit. Um, (laughs) uh, So we're going to use an applause meter. So... Anyone who wants Kevin's pick, uh, applaud. Right? Also, let's just re-familiarise people. We've all chosen scenes that we saw on the big screen that really left an impression on us. And uh, one of us is going to get to screen that. So oh. there's going to be another, there's going to be another yes. pick that's going to be screened. Okay, sort of right. like, yeah, personal pick. The moment that mattered. So Kevin's pick, which was, I can't even remember it. Bowfinger. So Bowfinger. Round of applause. Oh, you bastard. Oh, ah, yes. <laughs> Yes. And that concludes the end of the you podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, a round of applause for uh, Connor's pick, An American Werewolf in London. Oh, it's mattering, yeah. it's mattering. Okay. Sex sells. A, a <laughs> applause for my pick, Sherlock Jr. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm taking this personal. Yeah, you okay. got a woo as well. Uh, and a round of applause for Kate's pick, Scream 2. <laughs> I think... I I actually don't know. That's hard. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. What, 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 do we, what do we judge this? I don't want to see your pick, so I want to go with Kate. <laughs> go, Kate wins! Oh, congratulations. Yes. 
Wow. So, okay, so option D then, if you can roll it there, pop it. Scar! Brother, help me! Long live the king. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, so Kate's good. pick was uh, her, the, the scene that she chose as a, the, a very impactful scene that she saw in the cinema was 1995's The Lion King. Maybe I got the year wrong. 94, I think. 94. I'm, I'm, and why that scene, Kate? Well, as I told you earlier, that time that my granny took me to cinema for the first time was this film. Oh, wow. And she let oh. me bring chicken nuggets into the cinema. And I was it all the, began. It all started there. <laughs> I yeah. love it. Set up, pay off. Oh, yeah, there you go. Like, <laughs> was that the ambassador? or Because I know that when they re renovated the ambassador, um, or what, what cinema did you see this? We in? went I know to that's see it in the OD, or the, it was the UCI in Kulak. I okay, think. yeah. Um, but yeah, she, uh, yeah, we went to McDonald's, delighted, got my chicken nuggets, brought them in. And I had never, I, you know, I, I don't have much memories before that. So I know this, I think, was the first time I was in the cinema. And I remember just being totally blown away. I definitely wasn't eating chicken nuggets during that. <laughs> no. It was just like really stuck with me. Um, very emotional still to this day. Lovely 2D animation as well. Did yeah. you like the remake, the live action? Well, I never it wasn't saw live it. action, the an Yeah. What would you it, call it? It? Was, it was okay, but it doesn't have the heart of this film for some reason. Um, like, I like the Jungle Book remake, but but like, I remember that scene as well. Like, I saw, I, I went to that film three times uh, in The Ambassador and there was something, because the first film I ever saw was The Jungle Book in when I was a kid in The Ambassador and then there was something Jungle about... Jungle Book Pinocchio. <laughs> I was The Jungle Book as well. Yeah. And I was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic pick. Fantastic. Actually, no, it was Jaws four. <laughs> we are. I'm. I, I am conscious of. Oh yeah, our, our time. Our time is coming to yeah, an end. Okay. Well, now, but there's business we have to do. This is that we're cl wrapping up our first live show. But we have yes. to do something very important, Kevin. What must we do? We gotta spin the bloody wheel. Spin the wheel. Yes. We're so enthusiastic whenever we have to spin the wheel. I love spinning the wheel. I Just can't wait to see what I have to do next. <laughs> yeah. It's just a wheel. It's on a little app. But People you're not going to spin it. No, Should Connor's going to spin it. Connor's going to spin the wheel. So I'll this turn week. up the volume. And if the there is any doubt, there price. actually is a wheel. There and, is. And uh, so this is... It is truly randomly yeah. selected. Kind of wish you made a big wheel to bring in. <laughs> we did, but just know, really yeah. wouldn't let us. Okay. Did you imagine trying to get that on? The he was trying to get on the plane. <laughs> plane. <laughs> we'll <stop> yeah. it. <laughs> okay, well, I spin. He's yep. spinning. Here we go. You can hold There's 200 the scene choices. Best magic mirror scene. Anything with mirrors. Oh, God. Say, what is it, Connery? What, was, what did you uh, do? Best magic mirror scene. Anything with mirrors. Best magic mirror it's scene. It's going to be American Werewolf when they closed. It's going to be like a load of people closing mirrors oh, and something the, behind them. See, the thing is, mir mirrors are kind of like trick shots normally. Then they're not full scene. Contact. Yeah. Contact, Contact yeah. has the oh. great mirror shot. Yeah. That was like. Not really seen, so they're yeah. like shots. Into the dragon. You know, Would the, you like that as an episode or will we spin it again? He's trying to get out of home. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> do mind him. <laughs> Louise. Oh God! <laughs> what does a magic mirror, though? I mean, I, I guess mirror. I, how spin it again in an interrogation room. So, uh, uh, whatever. What are we've called? already, Wavered. we've already, uh, we've already decided. It's it's. Contact. Oh, you're spinning it. Oh, it is. Okay, okay. Spin it again, and then oh we can God, you cheese! Go on, spin it again. So spin it again. Best exposition scene. Oh, oh, wonderful. <laughs> what, was, what was the second? <laughs> say, say what the second uh, was. Best exposition scene. Great. Oh, oh my God. Does that mean God. the best one where the exposition is hidden or the best one where it's... Stop. <laughs> <laughs> best dialogue you've seen. No, you uh, just... That was a mistake. Exhibition it will be. Okay, so for in the next episode, we're going to be doing best ex... Uh, ex how would you or would we do I love you that would be a good one Kevin will you stop it <laughs> I don't <laughs> like this is the stuff I have to put up with when we're actually recording and he's just saying actually do you know what I've got another idea it's 3am and Kevin's giving you more ideas because I know what my I love you scene would be I don't know what my exposition scene would be just be hi sis <laughs> <laughs> um, so we need to wrap up the episode Kevin we do what we need to do is we need to say thank you first of all we have to say thank you to our wonderful guests uh, uh, Kate and Connor thanks uh, give it up for Kate and Connor 
we have to thank uh, uh, Diff for inviting us, Grania, Humphreys, Aideen, Quiva, Nicola Paloma, Bobby, everyone who's helped out to make this happen. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to the Lighthouse Cinema for having us along. Thanks to Alexis and Killian who helped us with the technical stuff like uh, recording and, uh, and projecting. And uh, thank you to our audience for coming along and supporting us. That's the most important thing. Yep, we're an independent podcast. We wouldn't have been able to pull this off by ourselves. So it's down to the support of Diff to be able to, to do this tonight. And um, yeah, as, as we said, we're doing it now one year. We're really enjoying it. We started in lockdown and I, I hope it continues. So thanks for coming along. And uh, yeah, next week, I suppose. Give yourself a when round of applause. When this episode comes out. Right. <laughs> Best I love you scene. <laughs> Give yourself a round of applause. Thanks much, much everyone. <laughs> Cheers. And, and um, well. Oh, well, you've got, tell them what, tell the lovely audience what you've got for them. They've already got them. There are badges outside. If you didn't get a badge, then we've got extra ones there we can give to you. Oh, I was talking about yeah. the free cars that you'd arrange. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Do you want to tell them what your pick would have been? Oh! What scene would have been? What our scene would have been? Okay, oh, yeah, yours yeah. was, uh, Connor, what would be your uh, particular Mine scene? was Suspiria. Oh. Because, um, yeah, that was a film that I think, if I had have seen it on a, I think only the fact that I saw it in a cinema had the impact, you know. Wow. Yeah. Kevin, what would your pick have been? Mine was going to start with uh, Sharon Stone crossing her legs and then it was going to glitch. <laughs> and then it was going to be the scene from Room when uh, Jacob Tremblay uh, escaped. Not the, the Room. <laughs> and he gets to see the world for the first time. And I saw that in the cinema in LA with Lenny Abramson, like doing a Q&A. And I was afraid to go up to say to him that I loved the film so much because I thought I was going to burst into tears because uh. the film just was so impactful and just beautiful. And uh, that was going to be my pick. And yours? Uh, mine would have been Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade because I... But I what took, scene was it going to oh, be? Oh, it's a scene where they are being chased by, uh, chased by the um, German hel uh, planes and they are going through the tunnel and uh -huh. Harris, um, Sean Connery takes out his umbrella on the beach and uh, makes the seagulls fly up into the sky and causes the plane to crash. But I love it because I saw it with my dad. It was one of those few films that I saw with my dad and uh, I remember that moment in that video. Nice of him to actually go along with you. He went sure. along with me after, after the <laughs> Pinocchio experience because I was traumatised for the next six years. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, and if you didn't get any badges and stuff like that, come down here. Yeah, we have a bag here and just dig in and just take yeah. what you want. Great. But uh, thanks a million everybody. That's the episode. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kevin, that was the live show. What did you make of that? That was ticking the bucket list for me. I really enjoyed it, and I hope that it comes across to others because it was such a laugh on the night. And yeah. yeah, thank you to everybody that came out to the to the live show. Thank you, Will, for doing such a great job hosting that episode. I was able to just sit back and enjoy the episode from the sidelines. Listeners, Kevin had done so much work in preparation. He's really underselling himself. He did a huge amount of work to make the show happen, and it's all on his shoulders. The success of it was down to our guests, Connor and Kate. They were so loose and so relaxed and such good crack. Kate is not a loose woman. What are you talking about? <laughs> But yeah, I had, I had such a ball. It was great crack. It was. And let's do it again sometime. Hopefully. But not for a while because I'm knackered. <laughs> the stress, the stress load. So we're, we're going back into our normal routine and you got your topic from that spin of the wheel, which we you do. cheated. No, I didn't. Connor spun it by accident three times and I'm doing I Love You. Yeah, I love you. Next. Great. Subscribe. See you then. Goodbye. Best Bits Podcast is produced by Will and Kevin. All audio clips and music heard in this episode is the intellectual property of the respective copyright holders and no infringement is intended. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, share, subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff. If you have any notes, comments, scene suggestions, or just want to get in touch with us, email us at bestbitspodcast at gmail.com. And here is a clip from the lad's latest mini bits bonus show, the full episode, plus 80 more are available on their Patreon. See ya, Mossy. I gotta go in and record another one of these fucking mini bits. Oh, yes, this is so all is messy. I know. <sighs> what are you doing? I, right now, on the Academy screener site, and I hit play, because there's only a few films on it, for the first month or two. There's only like about less than 10 films on it. And Guy Ritchie's The Covenant is on here. 
So I hit play on that and I'm hearing all the, we're out in Afghanistan and I'm hearing all the dirt and I hear vehicles and I hear the sound effects of characters walking. But when characters open their mouths, I don't hear any dialogue. Mm -hmm. Oh, they've up- no dialogue. They've uploaded the wrong audio track. It's like that Tom Cruise yeah. trailer where it was just a sound effect. Like, have you met an SP? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this film has been up on the screen site for a few weeks now, and they still have the wrong one here. Well, I tell you what films are actually up there for all Academy members to see, and they see what they've put up Do, there. but first of all, let's just throw to our theme. And I have to say... The feedback from my thank you ballad thank you. was quite fierce. The power of Christ compels you. So I asked Mossy, who is a friend of my dad's at the quiz, sing us a theme tune. Oh. So over to Mossy. <laughs> Hit the cards. I'm fine. I'll get it done from one day. It's the many bits. Oh, my guess what will they say? With Will and Kevin Cox. The best fucking podcast. That'll do. <laughs> That'll do. My God. Thank you, Mossy. You would make an angel weep. That voice would make an angel weep. Telling you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Boolabus. It only cost us two months' patron money, so, you know. Is that all? Money well spent, in my eyes. Yeah. I mean, you can't get much for 20 euro. <laughs> Will, you were telling me before uh, the intro that you uh, were looking at stuff on the Academy Screeners website. The Academy Awards. So for official members, yes. So how we, they don't send out DVDs anymore. So how you do all your streaming stuff is all via the Academy website. And the streaming season has begun, which is exciting. So it means for the rest of the year. I'm Did it be- ever end? Uh, it does end. It does end. after the Academy Awards. There's about two weeks, and they <laughs> take all the films down, and then they begin again at the end of August, and they all start coming up. So it's a whole new collection of hopefuls. So how many films are on there right now? About ten, actually ten exactly. I can tell you the ten. Oh, um, go on, tell me. John Wick four for the Oscars. <laughs> oh, because there's like yes, they're adding in stunt category, aren't they? Are they adding it in? It's a stunt category being added. I believe they're adding in some sort of stunt category. Breaking news straight from an Academy member's mouth. Because they're adding in stunt category, aren't they? Slash film. I don't know. Did I see, read this in an article? I feel they were. They... I felt they were. ...have long overlooked stunts. And my God, it's pure artistry. Yeah. And it is incredibly... Well, these days, it's all fucking rubber computer generated... Avatars. That's why we should hide. That's why pe- these people should be getting their Oscars when, yeah. back when someone's actually gone out then. Yeah, go back, back to, absolutely. Go back and back give it to your man from Mad Max who broke his legs. And uh, give it to Richard Farnsworth, who uh, was a stuntman and was uh, starred in The Straight Story. Yeah, Richard Farnsworth is, was a career stuntman. Uh, absolutely. Wasn't that also mm-hmm. the case with um, uh, Machete? What's your man, Machete? Danny Trejo. Danny Trejo. Is really? It Trejo or Trejo? I always call him Trejo. But he just says, call me Danny. <laughs> I was going to say that back to you. Nah. Like, just, uh, <laughs> we were. Just, 